thanks everybody for joining us. Um, we were just joking that there's probably some nerdy uh, analogy between it being so hot outside and freezing cold in here and needing to self-regulate and adapt to the changing, uh, what do we call it, climate control. So hope you're all hanging with us. Thanks for joining. We've got quite the crew up here, a combination of folks that think from the highest level about energy transition, um, uh, down to some of the innovators that are working to put these solutions in our homes, in our buildings. Um, and I uh, would love to introduce, introduce everybody up here. I'll start with myself to kick us off. Uh, my name's Sophie. I wear a couple different hats. One of them includes writing a newsletter called Climate Tech VC, which goes out to an audience of folks that are curious about the deal activity and the news and the innovators and change makers in this emerging climate tech space. Um, and I also invest in some of those early stage businesses. But uh, most importantly, let's see, which way should we go? We've got Matteo far over on this side, who hello, Hi. Hello. <laughs> um, is the founder and CEO, is that correct, of, uh, of, uh, of Forum Energy. And then we've got Donnell from Block Power. Um, you're usually up in Brooklyn, is that correct? That's right. That's right, coming all the way down here. Right. Um, and then we've got Jan from Guidehouse. Do you have a particular title at Guidehouse? Um, well, it's a long title, but <laughs> I have a team of about 1,000 people that are really working with uh, government as well as large organizations, investors around anything related to climate change and energy transition. Brilliant. A good title. Um, talking about titles, title of this session, what, what brought you all in here is Plugging into the Neighborhoods of the Future. There's many ways of interpreting that. We love a good pun, uh, pun here. I think we'll run with that, thinking about built environment, energy transition, what does innovation and technology have to do with it, and where do we need to go beyond that? So uh, I'd like to start off with a stat, and one of those that um, gets us up and thinking about this space in particular is that about 40% of greenhouse gas emissions or CO2 equivalent comes from the built environment or from um, uh, uh, buildings, just said simply. So that comprises of Many different sectors go into that, right? Everything from electricity to uh, consumption across from transportation to agriculture and where our food, food comes from, um, through to the building blocks that go into erecting some of this infrastructure um, uh, and the utilities and grids that underpin it. So neighborhoods, what you know, brings us all together are really these puzzle pieces building up this larger system, which is quite symbolic of the broader decarbonization challenges. So it's nice to be able to think about an individual unit and how that's representative of the whole. So we're going to try and keep bringing this conversation back to neighborhoods and how does that impact all of us and, and our role within that. So um, uh, why, are we, why are we talking about, why are we talking about, about neighborhoods? Um, why are we talking about this? Um, this energy transition. I said the 40% um, of emissions come from the built environment. Anybody want to add on to that? What's the climate impact of this phrase of, of electrifying, electrifying everything? You're, you're, the, you're the buildings guy, I don't know. <laughs> Fine. Um, it is now possible for us to decarbonize a single building, which means we can decarbonize a community of buildings, mm -hmm. which means that we can now decarbonize a whole city. And that's not like Silicon Valley bullshit. That, that's stuff that we can do with existing software and hardware and financing now. And so uh, what my company does is try to implement that and put that into practice. Um, and so we recently partnered with uh, Ithaca, New York, as the first city in the world to commit to decarbonizing 100% uh, over the next uh, seven years. Um, we hope to get it done in four. Um, and so what does it mean to decarbonize the city of Ithaca, New York, where Cornell University is located? It means we're going to decarbonize all the buildings and we're going to decarbonize all the cars. So again, this isn't like new R&D, um, you know, we got to invent new hardware, new software, new financing tools. Like, we have everything that we need to decarbonize a whole city. And so if you can do one building or a community or a whole city, then, yeah, like, you can do a state or multiple cities or a country. Um, so we have everything that we need to, like, be serious about decarbonization in the building sector, uh, in my opinion. 
that's a good place to start. Perhaps uh, uh, not to do an either or, but uh, Matteo, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the potentially missing pieces in that ability to electrify, electrify everything? Yeah, well, I won't do an either or, I'll just add on top. Um, you know, there are lots of kinds of buildings and residential or commercial buildings is one kind. We also have, of course, industrial buildings, uh, which house industrial processes, right? And those, um, to decarbonize that kind of thing requires uh, still more um, uh, solutions to come to the table, some of which we have in hand and some of which we don't, um, or rather cost-effective solutions we don't necessarily have in hand uh, for that today. And, um, and that is, of course, the overriding concern here, right? Uh, the reason why Donnell's able to do what he, he's able to do is because it is cost competitive. It is the smart thing to do, right, economically now. Um, that wasn't the case 10 years ago, right? Um, and, the, and we are sort of at that 10 years ago moment uh, on the residential commercial side of things, now on the industrial side of things um, for those processes. So, so when I say industrial processes, I mean chemical processes or steel, for example, uh, you know, the built environment, right? Um, uh, the, the, the actual materials that go into that. And, um, and that means that we need to decarbonize uh, a lot of things all, all the way upstream. Um, we need to decarbonize the process to get those materials. Um, and if uh, in getting those materials you use electricity, we have to decarbonize that electricity that goes into those, that, that production process. Um, and so in the end, <clears throat> to, to solve all the buildings challenge, um, uh, residential, commercial, and industrial, um, then we do need to be able to bring to bear other solutions uh, that maybe not don't sit on site or maybe partially sit on site and somewhat off site. Um, and this is where the consideration for just how we decarbonize the entire electric system is, is really part and parcel. You, you cannot divide it from this notion of decarbonizing uh, cities, which, you know, this, these built environments in, in which we live. Uh, so that's where my company uh, focuses, is on the kind of energy storage you need to enable that deep decarbonization uh, at the grid and, and truly retire and replace the thermal generation, which today provides still the vast majority of the electricity uh, that's going into the electric system. Brilliant. And Guidehouse sits working across all of these different sectors at once. So uh, it sounds like it's not enough to just electrify everything. What else? No, we I, I, I think I think Matteo was spot on. It's it's the, it's the entire system, and and I think my colleagues will agree as well. Buildings become part of the system, actually, uh, in terms of not not only using. Uh, uh, electricity, but also potentially producing electricity and, and providing it back to the grid. But the system itself, and, and, and it's been pretty clear to me for the last five years how the system of the future will actually look like, it will not only have um, electrons, it will also have molecules, um, clean molecules. Um, I come from the Netherlands. Uh, we have very long and cold winter months. Um, not a lot of sun, um, and an even wind, uh, uh, and we have a lot of offshore wind uh, uh, in, the, in the North Sea. Uh, wind production is, is low. Um, we've done a study uh, and we looked at the entire uh, European Union. A system that is 100% electric, uh, uh, electrify everything, is about $200 billion more expensive uh, a year um, versus a more balanced system where you do have uh, uh, renewable gas, uh, renewable fuels, uh, green hydrogen. Um, so long term, it's going to be a system that has both uh, uh, renewable gas and fuels as well as electrons. Um, uh, electr electrification of buildings is a very important pathway as well as transportation, uh, but it's not going to be enough. There's going to be some parts that are going to use molecules uh, to get to 100% decarbonization at an affordable cost for society. Um, um, uh, and then, you know, long, long haul trucking, uh, industries, Matteo mentioned it, those are all parts of, of decarbonization that uh, are hard to do without a renewable gas or renewable fuel. Running with that, taking us to the global stage and how that might impact our individual neighborhoods, thinking about the current conflict that's going on in Ukraine, do you see any, any um, um, accelerants coming out of that that might impact increased adoption or speed of even some of the specific technologies that, that you both individually work on? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one because um, it's close to home for me. Um, uh, um, yeah, I, I, obviously it's 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 very very sad, uh, horrible, horrific um, uh, what's happening there. Um, uh, but I, I actually do think it's going to accelerate things um, uh, in Europe a lot in terms of you know energy independence uh, from you know carbon fuels, uh, oil and gas long term. Um, we've done a lot of work around alternative fuels in, in Europe, as I mentioned before. 
uh, and what I've seen in the last couple of months around the discussions at, at, at you know at the EU level, uh, political level, at the country level, as well as you know organizations that are making uh, uh, big investments. Um, the only small silver lining of this is it's going to accelerate things significantly in terms of finding ways to decarbonize the European system uh, and make it less dependent of, uh, from oil and, and, and gas. And when I talk about the system, again, it includes everything, right? It includes shipping, it in includes you know, uh, air transportation, uh, all the things, and then obviously the cities uh, there as well. Um, the challenge in Europe, um, and, and some cities have you know, the same challenge here in the US and, and you know New York is, 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 is one you know old existing buildings uh, multi-story buildings you know uh, uh, not really uh, well built um, you know how do you do that in a, in a cost-effective way so that's that's part of the building challenge in Europe with you know some very old parts uh, in Paris and Amsterdam and Brussels and, and you name it so that will be that will be challenging from a building perspective to decarbonize that those in a very short period of time and take out natural gas because all those buildings right now are being heated by natural gas. I was in um, Glasgow for the UN, the feckless UN COP26 meeting. I didn't say that, the UN meeting, I was there. And um, uh, Vice President Gore has the Climate Reality Project and I'm on the board with him and so we were meeting with some of the leaders in Glasgow um, who are from the city of Glasgow which really did an amazing bus electrification campaign in Scotland and is kind of leading the United Kingdom in that. And because um, I'm a male millennial, I was like, oh, I'm in Scotland. I'm going to go see where Braveheart fought at. And we're going to like, we're going to decarbonize and electrify some of his castles that Braveheart was. Well, and so, you know, I'm not kidding. Like we went out and we, we, we talked to some of the people who own buildings that were built in the 1400s and 1500s and 1600s around like what could we do to actually decarbonize like super duper old buildings um, across Scotland. And so there's a little uh, team that's uh, work, working, the, the same folks who worked on the bus electrification um, campaign are now thinking about that. Um, but it is a massive challenge. I mean, it shouldn't be underestimated. I do think based on um, some conversations that we had with Senator Schumer's team and Senator Manchin's team, there does seem to be, in this really horrible political environment that we are here in, in the United States, there is consensus on supporting Ukraine. And the, the talk internally seems to be like, well, can we come up with some kind of like Marshall Plan um, for decarbonizing buildings in Europe in this moment? Um, as we look to try to pass a bipartisan or um, uh, reconciliation bill to, 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 to move climate policy uh, here in the U.S., can we have something in tandem? Um, and so there, there is broad bipartisan support for that. So there is this moment, right, if we can seize it um, to really drive not only um, an inflection point for, for U.S. climate work, but also in Europe, and, you know, it remains to be seen what we do with this moment, I think. Yeah, and sorry to jump the line, Matteo. The other thing in Europe is um, Europe has been really, really bad in energy efficiency of buildings, by the way. Um, so there's now a huge opportunity to, to work on the demand side um, uh, in Europe. Uh, the way we, I think, successfully um, uh, have you know energy efficiency programs, um, uh, also focused on underserved communities um, uh, uh, throughout you know big cities and states in, in the U.S. So, so I do think there's a there's a demand side energy efficiency opportunity for Europe because they they fell behind um, uh, to the U.S. for a long long period of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I'll touch on the topic from the very personal view of just running a startup. We're trying to develop a new tech, commercialize a new technology, and, which has never been commercialized before, and the. The demand in Europe, yes, it's very strong. Yes, they want to get off of, they want to transition even faster off of the Russian gas, which had been a talking point of mine, by the way, for like 10 years. 40% right. <laughs> of gas in Germany comes from Russia. Wouldn't you like to get rid of it? And, um, and, and we have to resist the temptation as a small startup. We're only 260 people now uh, with a massive demand here in the United States. We have to resist the urge to go promise solutions that do not exist yet. That will kill us as a company. And so I agree with everything, you know, yes, all of it. However, I have to be realistic from, from the small seat that I sit in. I have to be realistic about how fast I can scale. Because in the end, what we're talking about is, is 
a scale, you know, we're talking about continent-wide scale solutions that are being required. And that means tens of thousands of megawatts power production, right? Uh, just to put that in some perspective, Europe has roughly a terawatt of generating capacity, as does the United States, right, roughly. And so, th so we need to go build meaningful percentages of that amount of generation capacity in the next 10 years. And as one company, I cannot come close to addressing that. The goal is that by the end of this decade, by the end of the 2020s, my company is producing thousands of megawatts per year of the kind of battery that we produce, which would enable those renewable resources to fully replace, retire the coal, right? We're, by the way, a lot of coal from uh, Russia as well. Get, get rid of the coal uh, there. And, uh, and we can do that, but it is not a solution that the politicians want to hear about for the next two years, right? Uh, they want liquid natural gas uh, imports, uh, terminals to be built ASAP, and of course the uh, gas companies here in the US want to build them and deliver that, and it, you know, so it goes. Um, so I bring it up just to sort of highlight the reality of it, <laughs> uh, because I have to lead a company that is developing a product that will take some time to scale, and all of these solutions will take time to scale. And we should be realistic about that. And I don't mean, by the way, realistic to the, to the point of despondency or, or you know, uh, uh, sandbagging it. Like, we can do things very, very quickly at very, very high volumes. We need to be extremely intentional about it and organized about it. And, and part of it, by the way, and this is where I talk out of the other side of my mouth, is that the people who are making those decisions, the politicians and the policymakers, and by the way, you know, I'm in contact with many of those folks too, they need to know that the solutions will show up in the relevant time frame, right? So in some ways, what they need is a license to go push those things, knowing that the entrepreneurs, that, that the market, so to speak, will respond. Um, so that's the job of the entrepreneur, is to prove that things are possible and that they will show up in the right time. And we're doing that, but there's sort of a natural tension there. None of it happens as fast as any of us want. One, one last piece. I, I, think, I think that's well said. Um, one of the things that we are doing in our firm, be, because we are constrained as you guys are by the fact that we're a small startup, is we're doing an open source project. And, um, and so I think the Bezos Earth Fund, I think Andrew from Bezos is here at Aspen with us down in Miami. And um, they funded our nonprofit arm to build an open source project to build a digital map of every building in America so that we could offer a free decarbonization plan to every building in America. And so the question is, if you can put down the constraints of like, hey, I'm a venture-backed startup, I need to make money for my investors and provide a return, and say, how do we get the greatest minds from around the world to think about solvable, important, actionable problems right now, then you can have an open source platform where you have a global community of software developers who are building digital models of all the buildings across the world, not just America, including you know, Ukraine and Poland and Eastern and Western Europe, right? And so one of the things that we're looking at is like, how can we take the building science algorithms that allow us to um, help building owners across America understand what the ROI would be for decarbonizing their buildings and apply the same technology to Europe? Um, but we're constrained, so we have to do it in an open source model. And, and Matteo, I would say, I, I understand where you're coming from, um, but we have seen some technology scale very, very rapidly in the last you know, 20 years, right? From, from solar panels to where we are now with wind uh, and, and uh, what one wind, wind turbine now can produce, give it that the blades are really tall and, 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 and the poles are really high. Um, so it, it, it is gonna be, to, to address it, we are gonna find you know, ways to, to, to scale on steroids. Uh, there's no way. So if you have the right technology, then you better find a platform. Uh, you, can't be in, you can't be a small firm uh, uh, for long because you have to find a platform where you can absolutely scale that technology if it's going to be a game changer. And, and we're going to see that more and more. Um, I believe that all, if many or if, if not all, the technologies are out there. And now we need to just find the right ones that we can scale um, where it becomes really meaningful. And, and that seems like a big leap but it's going gonna, it's gonna to need to happen. Yeah, I, I don't mean to be pessimistic on that front. I for sure think we can do it. And, and there is no game-changing technology that does not scale. 
that is that is the calculus that that is fixed at this point. And you know the way that they play, that played into the consideration of my company, we picked a chemistry iron and air, which pretty much fundamentally scales throughout the world. So we, we can't do something like open source you know code. But what we can do is pick a material set that can be made anywhere on any continent by just about anybody else. And that, that's our equivalent in the hardware world of open sourcing is not being reliant on uh, you know, proprietary uh, algorithms. And, and the rest of us are just waiting with bated breath. I mean, the accomplishments that you guys have achieved so far could like literally save the human race. And so no pressure and like good luck and you know, Godspeed. <laughs> Thank you. We call that a mic drop, I think. <laughs> um, so with this, the uh, I think what you said is 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 um, uh, deploy, 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 as Jigger Shaw likes to say um, on on Twitter quite frequently. And the other side is that uh, the counterpoint would be: Do we need innovation then if it's all about deployment? And if so, um, uh, if so, where do young companies fit into this? And how best to work with some of your clients, potentially, who I assume are more on the corporate side. Yeah, so um, uh, it might be a little bit controversial, and I've, I've had this discussion for many, many years uh, with, with folks in the industry. Um, I, I'm a firm believer that, that we have um, most, if not all, of the technologies that we need to uh, address uh, climate change and to decarbonize our economies 100%. And it's all about scale right now. It's all about scaling. Um, and, and what these guys are doing is amazing. And, and if we could scale that, that would, that would, real, that would have a real, real impact. Um, I'm not saying innovation will go away and we don't need innovation. I think innovation will continue. But I think right now, if we want to solve the problem and we need to focus, we have to focus on scale. Uh, and we need to help you know, um, really game-changing technologies and, and companies uh, to find bigger platforms or, you know, uh, uh, crowdsource it around the world one way or the other and, and, and get to that scale. Um, um, again, so I'm not saying innovation is dead. Uh, I think we'll continue to innovate and we'll see new technologies and, and we'll see things that we've not even seen, right? I, I, I imagine five years ago that we would have, you know, devices on our home that would actually, you know, would be small and, and would generate enough, you know, electricity, you know, five gigawatts to just power the home. So. N nothing else, just on my roof, and, and not rooftop solar, but much smaller, like, you know, something like this would, would you know, power my house. Um, so we're going to see things that we haven't seen yet. But right now, um, uh, because the clock is ticking, uh, we need to scale the technologies um, uh, that are, that are going to be, you know, making the difference in terms of decarbonizing. And it's, it's not only wind or solar or, or offshore. I, I mean, the U.S. is the U.S. has so much to do on, on offshore wind, it's almost embarrassing how much we need to do here in the U.S. Um, uh, hydrogen production, uh, uh, long duration storage, energy efficiency, demand side. I mean, there's, there's really neat technologies and, 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 and solutions right now, right here. We just need skill. And, and, and for that, we need you know, governments and, and, and cities and communities to have the courage. Um, uh, we, we definitely also need the, the vision um, and the tenacity. Um, money is here. We, we have enough finance uh, right now. I mean, all private equity firms and investment companies are our clients, and they come to us and, and say, Jan, where do we invest in? Just tell us the companies where we have to invest in. There's a lot of money available right now for the right technologies that can help solve this problem. Yeah, one thing I think we do need to do is um, totally rethink transportation. Uh, you know, when, when, once you're immersed in the world of energy and you think about you know, how many watt hours go, go to one thing versus another, it, it's ludicrous that, that, we, that we move 5,000 pounds to move 200 pounds, right? That's one human, a large one, sitting in a car and driving around. And, you know, that, so you take a look at the, the, the ratings, right, the electric vehicles that are coming out, you know, a very good, a very efficient uh, electric vehicle, I used to work at Tesla, by the way, um, uh, gets about 250 watt hours per mile, right? On a bike, it's 10 watt hours per mile. And, you just you, you cannot look at the energy challenge that we have in front of us and not see that that is a major problem. And additionally, when we think about the materials going into things, right? Cobalt, of course, is a conflict mineral. Uh, it comes from Congo, owned by Chinese. Uh, it's very good for energy density, and there are ways to to maybe get that out of there. Uh, although you have one in your phone, you have plenty of cobalt in your phone right now. Um, but th speaking of electric buses, is a higher use for cobalt to be for personal transport or for a electrified 
system that that moves you know many many people many many times. So I don't. It's it's an unavoidable fact of this energy transition that we will have to revisit a lot of the assumptions for how we do things, and I think transportation is near the top of the list there. We can't just say, take all the cars that we make, 200 million new cars made every year, and make them electric, problem solved. That is not solving the problem. I was reflecting on um, your comment about there's a lot of money in the system, and there's a lot of government interest out there, but they need courage. Are there things that we can potentially bring back to the government, maybe that's data on things like jobs or data on um, uh, other other information sharing that we can we can bring back and be more collaborative in conjunction with governments that are providing funding to us. Well, I, I, I think that I think the capital markets. I mean, my opinion. I'm gonna throw this bomb out there. I think that capital markets, as currently constructed, are not suited to solve the climate crisis. I don't hmm. think that what you see in large cap private equity or mid-market private equity or early stage climate tech for hardware or software or both are, um, they're just not structured to provide the kind of solutions that we need. And if, to go back to Jigger's quote, what we need is deploy, 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 there, there is no early stage market to deploy existing technologies, right? Like in America, like that, that does not exist, right? So there is no like deployment bank or deployment venture capital fund that you could go to. Because deploying existing solutions doesn't provide the kind of returns that early stage investors in America look for. And so I'm becoming increasingly alarmed that in this moment where we really need to be um, you know, all hands on deck to generate new solutions and deploy solutions that we already have, that we, we, we have a, a set of capital markets constraints that aren't suited to the crisis. I'm, I'm, I'm very alarmed about that. And privately, when I talk to other clean tech entrepreneurs, like we're all really alarmed about it. Let's build on that. Where are some of those pools of capital that, that could be better suited? Is that from catalytic capital providers, philanthropic side, government funding? Yeah, yeah I mean, I, would say, I mean, you know, theoretically, if you were like redesigning the system, you would say that like, Family offices, philanthropic foundations would invest in early stage R&D or sponsor equity or project equity to de-risk deployment, mm -hmm. right, of scaling existing hardware solutions, right? Instead, that's not what's happening. It's the opposite, right? And so when you look at, like, universities um, and ph philanthropy, that's where you would want to see climate innovation, then you'd want it to see it be adopted by, like, the small business innovation research fund that the Department of Energy or Department of Defense, um, and instead the, the system kind of is backwards, right? And so what you really pra practically have happening is um, uh, climate tech venture capital has rebranded itself and is you know providing capital to certain kinds of solutions but not others, and then government investors are getting their signals from climate tech and then philanthropy is kind of not in the game at all in a real way, and that's kind of where we are. I think part of that is to bring along the large capital deployers who are good at that already and, and remove any roadblock that they have to deploying the right cap climate solutions in their space. And here I'm talking about utilities. You know, they need to be co-opted, for lack of a better term there, to deploy the right solutions. And those could be charging uh, stations for vehicles. They could be just electrification, broadly speaking. Um, you know, those entities, their whole business model is deploying capital. That's what they do. They are capital deployers. Um, so, and they do it at scale, right? And in fact, they would, they would deploy much more if they were uh, uh, enabled to. Um, so, so how do we, I don't have a solution, by the way. I'm just saying, how, how do we, get them to go deploy the right solutions I, and put all I, that capital. I'd love to see like ultra high net worth individuals instead of buying media companies, like go buy a utility. It's happening in Australia. Did you see that buyout? Well, I he, did it. What are you, what are well, you he referring didn't, to? He hasn't done it yet. He hasn't done it yet. Do you want to you share? It's, well, uh, it's Mike Cannon Brooks, the founder of Atlassian, one of the founders, and uh, has an enormous personal fortune, tens of billions of dollars. And he's buying, he's made a bid to buy uh, one of the old mainline uh, generators in, in Australia called AGL. And 
it was rejected once and he came back again. I think uh, he's got some financial partners now. Um, and the intention, stated intention, is to retire the coal earlier and replace it with renewable power generation. Yeah, that's on the generation side. I, I think the value of utility, is, so I think it's going to happen that somebody will buy utility. Um, because if you understand where utility will be five, year, ten years from now, it's going to be a network orchestrated platform, um, which, have, which will have a lot of technologies, will have the clients, and it will drive a lot of technologies through that platform. So I think it's just a matter of time where, well, high, you know, tech companies already have the interest, but I think, I think some, some high net worth people will see the value of that network platform uh, of the future and, and start to invest in it. I think, uh, I think utilities are changing rapidly, um, and that will just accelerate it. So I think that's just a matter of time. Um, but back to capital, I think we need all of the above, but we are very, very um, uh, optimistic about uh, both startup uh, capital uh, availability on certain platforms. We should talk about that as well as, you know, uh, uh, deployment. Um, um, I, I would like to see more collaboration between, you know, uh, government funding and, and private funding. I think that's, that's very key uh, for states, for cities, for communities. Um, they, they serve the, the best interest. So if you can take some IAGA money and, and, and link it up with some private equity money and, and, and do something in a city or community, that, I think that would be awesome. Uh, we, see, we, need, we need more of those examples. Don't see them enough, enough so far. Um, to, the, to the climate climate tech capital aspect, we tracked some of that information. And it was just in the past, past fiscal year, just in venture capital, so that small slice, it was $40 billion in, in fiscal year 2021 into 600 climate tech specific deals. Yeah, and it's, it's doubling year over year, yeah, at least. What is the percentage, what right. is the percentage of that capital that is actually tied to greenhouse gas emissions reduction directly, right? And so when you look at the data on the percentages, of the capital that's been invested in climate tech that is directly responsible for greenhouse gas reduction, like not tracking it, not monitoring it, not looking at a satellite image of a tree in the Amazon and trying to figure out, did somebody chop it down? Do I have a carbon offset for that tree? Did someone burn it? Like direct reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, what, which is what we need to survive the percentage of that capital that's invested in climate tech that's responsible for those direct reductions is much, much lower than it needs to be. And that is really problematic. Because what will happen is you'll end up with a boom bust cycle, which is what happened back in 2011, 2012, when I started my company and started fundraising. And everybody just lost a shit ton of money in climate tech. And so they'd been burned, and they didn't want to continue to invest in climate tech because climate tech, quote unquote, loses money. So I think it is great that it is now the trend or people are excited uh, in Silicon Valley to invest in climate tech. It is important that we have winners like what you guys are doing that are producing real substantive reduction of greenhouse gas in the real world, not just bits, but atoms, because the climate crisis is occurring in the world of atoms. And so, I do want to, not to be the Cassandra, but as, as an entrepreneur that talks to other climate tech entrepreneurs, we spend the majority of our time wasting time trying to raise capital instead of focusing on the innovations and solutions that we all need to save the planet. And that must be fixed. Well, well the experiment's being run right now. We'll see, we'll see how investors pull back uh, going forward. I mean, the right. Markets are super volatile. Tech is off, right? Stocks are down. The Nasdaq, you know, uh, so, somebody get me the vapors. It's down from 18, you know, from where it was 18 months ago. <laughs> no, never mind. It looks great uh, as compared to five years ago. But, uh, but that that experiment is being run right now, and we'll see if they pull back on climate more versus you know some of the other tech that's out there. On the other hand, uh, climate tech is a much broader term than it used to be. And now it encompasses types of companies that never would have sort of been in that bucket that first time around. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll see. Yeah, yeah again, I, I'm more glass half full. I, I understand the struggles. Um, uh, parallel to offshore wind, right? 20 years ago, Shell and other oil and, co oil and gas companies invested in offshore wind and, and pulled back, as an example, that was at, at, at big scale. Um, I think offshore wind is here to stay now. So it's all about timing, and I know it's hard once you had a, a, back, a bad experience. 
Um, but I, I truly believe that um, even from a reporting perspective and shareholder value and multiples, um, this is a really good place to be, and, and that's what the investment community thinks. Are, there, are they there yet? Absolutely not. Are there, are there big gaps? Um, are they here and, and they need to understand what's going on down here? Absolutely, but I think it's a matter of time and those, and those, those connections will be made where um, uh, smaller, you know, really innovative technology startups uh, should, should have options um, versus, you know, spending 80% of your time, you know, looking for money. Um, um, yeah, that's I, mean, I think the premise is like, in order to save the planet, the planet's going to be fine, or save the human race, like, should entrepreneurs or innovators of any kind who are developing the new hardware and software that we need, should we have to persuade a bunch of like old rich dudes that we're going to make them richer? Is that, like if it doesn't work out, right, and like we all burn alive in 50 years or whatever, will we look back and be like, well, we tried to do it, but like enough of the innovators weren't able to convince enough like old rich dudes that they were going to get richer off the solutions? Because the, the challenge is with the current system, we might, there might be an innovator who develops the solutions that we need, but they don't get the capital because it doesn't fit into the current structure of capital markets. And that's the problem that we really have to address and think about. And like, I don't, I, I, I think the view that I'm sharing here publicly is the view amongst entrepreneurs broadly. I mean, I think you're a superstar, so it's different for you. But for those of us who didn't like work at Tesla and you know, it's, it's too hard to actually make this stuff work. And I'm a pretty successful entrepreneur, and um, it's been way too difficult for me to access capital. Part of that is I'm black, part of that is I'm not a scientist, part of that is I don't look like Bill Gates and didn't drop out of Harvard at 19 years old. Like, I don't fit the archetype, but archetypes matter, and they shouldn't, because if you really believe that genius is evenly distributed throughout the human population, then innovation is going to come from an even distribution across the human population and that innovation is going to need to be capitalized and that's like our best shot. Wouldn't the, uh, well first of all like agreed, um, is, isn't the push then that you would want more venture capital in that space to go find additional opportunity and look globally and look at um, uh, folks bringing their innovation and ideas from, from different markets? Well, I think that's one of the reasons that I think what you're doing is so exciting, right? Like, venture capital has to, like, look and feel different. Mm -hmm. Like, you represent a different generation, a new kind of venture capitalist, like we you yourself, emojis. right? <laughs> right? And so venture capital would have to, like, dramatically shift in order to be an appropriate solution. And it needs to shift structurally in terms of, like, 10-year commitments from right. GPs to LPs, and it needs to change in terms of who are the gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. You cannot have a capital solution where 97 fucking percent, right, of the money goes to one type of person, mm -hmm. a male person who's white, and then say that solution is going to produce the solutions for the human race to avoid the climate crisis. If women and people of color can only access 3% of venture capital, like, it's just not a suitable solution for the types of innovation and unlocking the genius that's inherent in all of us. And so that's why I am such a fan of your work and what you're doing, because I think you are really bringing a new generation to venture capital. And so if the future of venture capital for climate tech, because I don't give a shit about the rest of it, but if the future of venture capital for climate tech looks like you, then we'll, we'll be in better hands. The question is like, what is the timeline by which that transition may occur? Mm -hmm. And will it happen in time for our kids and grandkids to avoid the worst impacts of climate change? And I think that's an open question. I'm a real downer on this panel. No pressure. I'm sorry. No pressure. No, I, I, but again, that's not. I don't think that's unique for our industry. Or, or, or you're absolutely right. Um, I think it's more important because I think you know all the people in this world are, are impacted. But you know, underserved communities even more than others. We've seen that. Um, but now you're get, getting back to okay. So you know, how do we you know educate people that are more diverse uh, in you know climate financing, right? So. Um, my son goes to uh, Notre Dame. Um, I went there, um, and, and he's 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 uh, he's mixed uh, because my wife is is African American. Well, if you arrive at Notre Dame, it's pretty damn white, uh, and and all those kids that that study finance at Notre Dame, they end up with the with the venture capital uh, firms and the private equity firms. So, that's a that's a hard problem to solve. Um, uh, but we, it's going to start there. It's 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 going to start educating 
people that will take those positions um, uh, where they where they you know make different decisions um, and, and more balanced decisions. Um, but it also I think also comes down to you know uh, uh, leaders like you know Calvin Butler, who's you know who's the chief operating officer for Exelon, um, um, and and he's really you know. Uh, leading a charge there as well. Um, so, 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 you know, it, it, the whole, it, you know, equity and, and you know, diversity angle of this is, is very complex. Um, we need it all. Um, but we still need skill uh, to solve it uh, at, at the same time. Um, we've seen really um, interesting projects um, where we run energy efficiency programs in underserved communities and we use minority-owned businesses to, do, to, to the implementation of energy efficiency programs. Those are, I think, great examples, and we need, much, we need, we need many more of those. Mm -hmm. I suppose to wrap it up, like the, the, the question of how is it different, why is it different here, is the timeline. We need this now. We need this immediately. We need these large-scale structural changes to happen on an accelerated science-based timeline. So that would be um, my suggestion for we must move much faster. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm and I'm very and I'm very positive. What I'm not positive uh, about is how quick we change the people that are actually making those decisions. So mm -hmm. I, I agree with that. I'm I'm pretty. I think that's gonna that's gonna slow us down significantly. So can we convince those white dudes to to make the right decisions in terms of investment versus wait for my diverse you know uh, private equity and, and venture capital folks like you? I don't know. That's gonna be that's gonna be an interesting uh, a challenge right there. Uh, I'm, I'm less optimistic about that if I look at you know what's coming out of universities uh, and the people that 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 join those firms that ultimately make those decisions. Mm. Well, there's this swell of climate first folks, right, who are uh, who were born and always knew that this was going to be their problem, that they were going to inherit this, and uh, and and. They're moving so fast um, and are incredibly educated. There's tons of them in audiences like this. And they're reading and they're learning and they've been thinking and innovating and they've been at home and now they're taking leadership positions and just accelerating incredibly quickly. So how do we bring them in and bring them in to be a part of the conversation and give them the tools and, and access to, we've been talking a lot about finance. Finance is just really one part of it. Education, you know, it goes on and on and on. Um, we have, we have so many different ways we could take this conversation, but uh, I think it's important in-, in uh, I want to hear Donnell's positive comment. Open it, open it up. What's your positive comment? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no I, I would say uh, one of the things that's most exciting to me is you do see a new cohort of investors, but part of that new cohort, cohort of investors is um, a diverse cohort of climate, technology firms that are led by diverse leadership who have been successful and in true Silicon Valley style are paying it forward to invest in the next generation of diverse climate tech entrepreneurs. So as an example, like I've, you know, we've raised $100 million for Black Power. We invest in, you know, we write small checks to the next generation of up and coming, you know, women, people of color who lead climate tech firms. And that is the Silicon Valley way, right? Like as you reach the new level um, of entrepreneurship that you reach back and invest in the people behind you. And that is a really encouraging sign, um, not only on the venture capital and the finance side, but on the entrepreneurship side that there is this new generation of entrepreneurs who really as a generation are focused on solving this problem. I feel like that was positive. Good. And, and, it does, and it does need to be Silicon Valley, right? I mean, I think, you know, right. down here in Miami, New York, um, in, in Europe, you have some amazing hubs around, you know, innovation and diversity. Um, so it can be anywhere. That's right. That's Love that. Um, talking about sharing the microphone, perhaps we can do that with this audience as well. So I think we have about 10 to 15 minutes left. And... Um, we genuinely want to open it up and, and hear from all of you. There's so much there's so much further we could go here, whether it's additional technologies, the role of jobs, policy. You can grill these folks on their amazing individual companies, which they didn't get a chance to give the elevator pitch for either. So feel free to please, please take it away. Hello, my name is Kira Owensby. I am a first year PhD student at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, studying energy science engineering, specifically looking at solid state batteries. I also work for a um, clean tech startup that looks at putting solar in economically distressed um, areas through um, carbon offsets for um, businesses. Uh, I, top or commercial? 
Um, this is utility scale. Okay. And so we're working with utilities to put in these solar projects. So a lot of moving parts. Um, I have a couple of questions, but for the sake of time, I'm just gonna ask this one. You all were kind of mentioning a lot of the different issues with like public versus private funding. And obviously there's a huge issue with that, but um, you um, in particular, Jan, were talking about the kind of collaboration between the private and public funds. And I'm just wondering like, how do we achieve that without there being some additional conflicts of interest? Because although it's great to get the additional funding because there's just so much more money in the um, private sectors than there are in public sectors, but again, it causes like different um, issues of like conflict of interest and making sure that different aspects, especially like on the university scale, which I know you all are also critical of, but a lot of um, different types of innovations come out of there that aren't purely like monetarily driven. And how do you think that we can kind of like strike a balance between that? Yeah, yes, so, so first of all, it's not easy. And, and as I said, we don't see it enough. Um, utilities are interesting uh, because, you know, you can look at the utility as the dinosaurs, right? And, and, and the ones that are slowing this whole energy transition down, uh, and that's why we're going to be in trouble, you know, 30 years from now. Um, but utilities have a very, and, and they not always act like that, but they, they do have a very social community responsibility, um, public responsibility as well. Um, and they do collaborate with universities, and they make funds available uh, for, for research and innovation um, in their space. And they can collaborate with cities or with states around, you know, uh, uh, street lighting or, you know, uh, uh, electric vehicle charging infrastructure or renewables. So I've always thought that uh, utilities should not be considered the dinosaurs, but should be the leaders of this energy transition. And if companies like, like like these companies can really team up with utilities and skill um, uh, using you know that that as a platform, then I think that's a really key opportunity. So I talk a lot about the utility as an orchestrator of the energy you know system and platform of the future. Um, and um, my biggest issue is with the regulators. I, I don't see the regulators allowing utilities to move you know at the pace that utilities you know, potentially could, could move. So if we get the regulators speed up things, and if we again then have innovation and small startups and universities and, and governments, local or, or at the state level, collaborate with these utilities, then you can take, again, IIGA money and, and take private uh, uh, funding for uh, EV charging or for street lighting, which is absolutely uh, 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 profitable right now. If you, if you go to LED street lighting, seven years return on investment, perfect. And any company, I will invest in that. So it is, it, I think utilities play, play a key role there. Uh, I've been saying it for seven, eight years. Um, and I, I see utilities getting there to be that orchestrator. Perhaps next question. Hi, my name is Allegra. I'm currently getting my MS in Sustainability Science at Columbia and work for a hardware company called GoPower EV that is bringing EV charging to multifamily housing. I'd love to hear from you too about scaling hardware to communities. It's such a different sales force than just scaling a software company. So I'd love to hear more about that go-to-market strategy and how you guys have reached out to communities to bring your product to them. Well, I I can't say I've ever done that. Uh, we're, we're developing a piece of hardware that will get deployed. Um, and first, it will get deployed with utilities, by the way, uh, because they're the ones that have the, they place the highest value on the thing that we're doing. Um, I, I was a part of the early supercharger effort at Tesla, so that's probably the closest thing that I, that I can rely on there. Uh, for anything that, that requires going into the built environment, you have to work with the built community that is in that environment. Um, no environment doesn't already have a community. You have to figure out you know, who that is. And um, Steph Spears, uh, who uh, I was on a panel with earlier um, today, said something super wise, uh, which is that um, when you're working with the community, you can only move at the speed of trust, that that is the rate limiter how fast you build trust. And so if you're going into communities trying to deploy hardware and you require their cooperation, which you will, then the speed at which you will go will be at, at the speed at which you garner that trust. And you, you have to earn it, to be clear. 
Um, and then there's all sorts of, uh, you know, that's sort of the, the community engagement side of it. But then anytime you're working in the built environment, there are just uh, regulations that you're going to have to deal with. There is an, there is an AHJ, an authority having jurisdiction that you're going to have to, you're going to have to get permits, you're going to have to do some building, right, that kind of thing. Um, the, the long takeaway is there's no shortcuts. <laughs> you, you have to be engaged at, at all those levels, uh, doing all the right things, and it just takes a certain amount of time. However, it takes a lot less time than most people assume that it does. And that was maybe one of the biggest learnings from, from the supercharger network that we built at Tesla was you know, people assumed it would take you know, years and years and decades to build the kind of thing that, that would be a high power DC charging network across the country and that it would cost orders of magnitude more dollars than it actually did. And the only way to sort of figure out where you sit on that is to go start, you know, be scrappy up front, engage the community, engage the, the whatever regulator you, is, is involved, and likely you will find that there is a cheaper, faster way to do it than is currently believed to be the case. So I would encourage you just to get started. How did we deploy it so quickly? We just decided to do it. That's it. You committed to doing it. Yeah. Com you know, it <laughs> Elon said, I want a charging network. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, we were fortunate. Tesla is a, you know, probably an exception in this case. When we were dealing with the guy who had to write the permit in Barstow, California, we gave him the keys to a Model S and said, why don't you, I'm going to go for lunch. If the car goes around the block a few times, I don't care. And guess what? I got the permit that day, right? So think, but now you don't have a model S you can give somebody, but what you do have is a mission that you can make somebody feel a part of, right? And whatever that, what, however you do that, tossing the keys to somebody or making them feel like their community is getting better, it's important to involve them, right? And that's where the trust, the trust is built. And, you know, we went really fast because we committed to it. There were, there were no governors on the spending that we had you know, functionally, um, and we just looked for ways around every obstacle that showed up, and there were many, but we got it done. I love the case study on urban stakeholder management. <laughs> we couldn't come up with anything better, even in Brooklyn. That's, that's excellent. I, I thought what he said was perfectly said. You can look at you know, you know, what the guys at BlackRock are talking about, stakeholder capitalism and different um, ways of engaging with your stakeholders. Can they share economic upside in, 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 in your project? I mean, you could do interesting things with like crypto or DAOs or, you know, there's different ways of engaging with people uh, beyond them being passive consumers that can also build trust, right? And can, so one of our sister companies has an environmental justice advisory board right, where f folks from the community own stock in her startup. So that's a different kind of alignment. We have time for one more, one more question. My name is Laura Levy. Some of you know me. I'm a, uh, I represent Glove Guard a company that finds solutions to issues to the environment. And as it is, all your opinions and what you said is valid, but in real life, it's very hard. It's very hard to introduce a new technology that is very expensive. Right now, in this county, I'm introducing a technology that will get rid of a landfill that we have problem with, an incinerator. And this, I've been working on this specific issue for five years already, and I have not gotten the attention of the government, of the people in town, and anybody who can help me to put this machine into this landfill and eliminate this landfill. Of course, I'm not married to the monopoly energy store, that will not give me the attention because this machine produces free electricity. And as it is, in this town, there are a lot of people who doesn't have air conditioning or electricity, and it gets hot, it gets hot in Miami. So how can you integrate a technology that costs hundreds of millions of dollars and has 
support of other countries, banks, willing to lend to that technology 100% and pay for the whole technology and convince politicians and political dignitaries into accepting this machine as a new technology and get it done. Get rid of the landfill, produce uh, free energy, and get rid of the carbon footprint. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you. Thank you um, for that. Um, I was a community organizer before um, I went into uh, climate tech. And so I was trained to go door to door to build relationships with low income families and um, gain their trust and talk about what kinds of issues concern them. So it could be, I don't like the guys dealing drugs in front of my apartment building when I get home from work. It could be my, school, my, my kid's school isn't run well and we need a new principal in order to fix the school. But too often it's, hey, there's like a landfill or some chemical plant or there's a Superfund site or, um, you, know, you know, I was in Alabama recently in Lowndes County with the head of the EPA and like they don't have toilets. Like in America, they flush the toilet and the poo-poo goes into a pool in the yard. And so we're standing there in America looking at like raw sewage with like a kid who lives in the house and plays in a yard that has like feces and urine in her yard, front yard and backyard. And the whole community has that because there is no infrastructure in this county in Alabama. And so um, I think that um, what, you, what would need to have to happen is to try to apply some of the lessons of like local politics and community organizing and power building with project finance and green infrastructure. And so you have to look at both of those different worlds and try to take best practices and combine them into a local solution. And I'm happy to help so you can find me on LinkedIn and i um, happy to talk with you about some of the stuff that we've seen work in New York and California and different places. And maybe it might be applicable here in Miami. And we're also coming into Miami to do some work um, here in the city and we'll be happy to connect with you on that. So I think we're at zero time. We are. Thanks so much. Thank you for bringing it home locally as well. Yes. Yeah. And thank you. Thanks to our panelists. Thanks to the audience. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Onwards. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Thanks.